back everybody we are here the working brother with another talk this time hopefully without technical difficulties we have Miodrag Zarkovic welcome on the show how are you doing Miodrag? very well uh, thanks for the invitation how do you do uh, excellent excellent thank you for joining us it's an honor and a pleasure to have you for those that may not be aware uh, Miodrag is a Serbian journalist who has been to the Donbass many times we already recorded this intro, but then we had some difficulties. So why don't you tell us uh, exactly uh, how you got started in journalism and uh, how, what, what drove you to the Donbass originally? Well, how I started the journal, in journalism, uh, <laughs> like any journalist, I guess I was uh, stupid enough to want to actually <laughs> to the profession. Uh, and I was then stupid enough to like it, to love it, actually, to mm -hmm. be infected by it. And uh, ever since I'm, uh, it was in late uh, 96, 1996. Uh, it's more years than I than I care to to admit, but it's to count. Huh? Yeah, yeah, to count. It's twenty six and counting years, uh, more than quarter of a century. It's uh, more than half of my life, actually. So yeah, I'm a career journalist, and I I actually think that it's uh, there is uh, the famous TV show The Wire. Uh, is among other things is um, about journalism and uh, one of the characters in the fifth season says that it's a divine profession mm -hmm. and uh, I pretty much uh, agree with that you know I mean you you have the opportunity and uh, of course honor and obligation to report on things to the people who to people who don't have either time or opportunity or energy or whatever to so those things to see those things first candid you know mm -hmm. so i mean it's uh, it's really a profession possibly the, the best profession in the world for me it's definitely the, the best profession in the world and i i there is there are no two similar working days you know let alone same and uh, that's about journalism but uh, as far as donbas goes uh, i was working for um, media outlet let's say for a, for a web uh, website uh, in 20, 2016 i was working for a website that was uh, headquarters of which were in russia mm -hmm. and uh, editors of that site were in some contact with uh, people from donetsk people's republic from donetsk authorities Mm -hmm. At that point, uh, Donetsk and Lugansk were attempting to organize uh, local elections. Uh, eventually, those elections weren't organized because of the Minsk agreements, but uh, at one point they were actually, uh, they did uh, uh, schedule the elections for uh, the late fall of 2016, and they wanted uh, observers, international observers, so the invitation was sent to the website I'm work I was working for at the time, and the edit editor editorship how do you say editor editors of the of that site uh, forwarded the invitation to me because they knew that uh, I was I was asking them to send me to Donbas for a while. Miodrag, just to interrupt you for a second, can you move your camera a bit to get more in the center of the frame? There you go, excellent, Sorry. excellent. Sorry. Now continue. Uh, so, so that's how I went to Donbas, and I, I fell in love with Donbas uh, literally the, the moment I set my foot there. Uh, it was that was actually the first time I was in Russia. Also, I never been to Russia before that. But uh, Donbas impressed me even more than Russia itself, possibly because uh, I knew a lot about Russia even before I went there. But uh, I knew practi practically next to nothing about Donbas before 2014. So Donbas was a fascination of mine uh, for that reason and for everything that was going on there uh, uh, after 2014. So yeah, I was really impressed uh, with the people, with the culture, with uh, with the society. You know, uh, I mean, you can, I guess. Uh, create a state or a country fast uh, or, or, or abruptly, 
but you can't mm-hmm. create a society that easy. Society yeah. is a much uh, more complicated uh, phenomenon. And uh, what I saw there was a society. You know, people who feel responsibility for their actions and especially for their community, for their city, for their republic, for their neighbors, for their nation, for the culture that they chose to be part of. And uh, that was very obvious. I, 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 I'll repeat uh, it I'll say once more. It, it was obvious to me literally the moment I set my foot in Donbass. And um, ever since uh, that year, I was uh, in Donbass. Um, I, I, I don't recall it's only four, five or six times, something, something like that, as an observer. But ever since, uh, I've been going to Donbass uh, in my own organization, on, on my own uh, schedule and uh, plan. I guess that that also speaks uh, about uh, my impression of Donbass, because uh, I, I, like any journalist, I, I, I chronically lack funds, I never have money, I'm uh, always broke, and uh, somehow I managed to find um, resources to cover uh, my expenses for the trip and uh, stay in Donbass, mm-hmm. especially in the last year, because uh, I I uh, went to Donbass uh, at the beginning of the February of last year, 2022, because, of course, I, I sensed that something big is going to happen. I had no idea how big events are going to unfold but uh that's I, right you were there you were there when the special military operation started yes uh, accidentally basically like uh you got there like a week or so beforehand 10 days uh, actually the, yeah. to be precise 13 days before the military operation mm-hmm. and i was first first i was in lugansk then i was in gorlovka and then i went to donetsk and i i was in donetsk the, the, i arrived in donetsk the day uh, Vladimir Putin announced that uh, Russia is going to recognize uh, Donetsk and Lugansk People's Republics. Mm-hmm. And uh, I, w- I was with, with friends, you know, I mean, going over there for years and years. I, of course, have friends there. And I was with them at that moment. And um, that combination of joy and relief and even confusion on their faces or i mean it, it was it was it was a sight to see literally uh, I mean, and now one one year on how would you compare the the mood the, or like let's say in november when i met you there how would you compare the mood of the people then like that first day when you when you were there and the mood of the general population uh, in november when we were there it deter- the, the mood deteriorated uh, heavily which is not surprised at all because uh, they're still getting shelled. Yeah, yeah and they still have water restrictions, November, among other things. November was one of the worst months. Uh, actually, December was even worse. Mm-hmm. Wasn't there in December, but everybody keeps telling me that the late, that the second part of December was uh, possibly the, yeah. the, the the heaviest uh, uh, time for Donbas for Donetsk. Uh, so yeah, I mean, people are desperate. Uh, they are uh, shelled uh, on a daily basis. They have no water. Everybody keeps telling, keeps talking about. I mean, everybody, everybody in the West, in the Western mainstream media, keep talking about uh, difficult conditions in uh, Kiev or Kharkov or uh, Odessa or Dnipropetrovsk, which are cities uh, on the territory under Ukrainian control. But nobody keeps nobody nobody even mentions that Donetsk for uh, almost a full year is practically without water because Ukrainians stopped the water the moment uh, Russian troops Donetsk troops uh, took control of Mariupol. Uh, Ukrainian authorities, Ukrainian military uh, stopped the water supply for Donetsk and Mariupol. Because that's on a, on the same uh, water supply line, yeah, going from uh, Slavyansk on the north. So while uh, Ukrainians were controlling Mariupol, they couldn't do that because if they were to cut 
the water for Donetsk, they would all, they would at the same they at the same time they would cut the water for Mariupol too. So mm-hmm. when they were controlling Mariupol. They didn't want to do that, but the moment they lost control of Mariupol, they uh, just cut the water for uh, for the entire Donetsk uh, area, Donetsk Republic, practically. And uh, at first, you know, Donetsk had some water reserves, but of course it uh, it was used uh, very fast. So let's say ever since June, there is practically no water in uh, in Donetsk. I mean, people have like on average uh, once uh, every three day for an hour or two. Yeah, yeah. There are areas of Donetsk that uh, didn't that are without water for eight months, ten months. So yeah, considering uh, considering you went you went around a lot more in uh, in uh, the Donbas than I did when I was there. Uh, how would you compare, let's say, uh, the the view in uh, Lugansk, uh, Donetsk, and Mariupol? And not only like uh, the general people's view, but also like what you saw, what what you were witness to. People in Mariupol were shocked, uh, and I I guess to a certain extent they still are, even though the fighting there ended uh, in early May, effectively in April. But those um, that month and a half uh, of the fighting there. Uh, really shocked them thoroughly uh, to the bone and um, I, I think that they're still in shock uh, many of them wanted to uh, be part of uh, Donetsk People's Republic or Russia of course some don't uh, some didn't want to and do, still don't but uh, I think the, both uh, groups are uh, totally um, surprised or stunned by, by what happened at least that's what they kept telling me uh, when I visited. Uh, I was among the first journalists to enter Mariupol in uh, in March. I was actually with with an Italian colleague, uh, Giorgio Bianchi. We were the first uh, journalists or reporters to be allowed into Azov bases when they were um, taken by by Donetsk uh, People's Army. Mm-hmm. And uh, then we proceeded to Mariupol. Yeah. So uh, anyway, uh, uh, when we were we were freely talking with with citizens of Mariupol, nobody uh, forbid us to talk with anything to, with anyone to report on anything. You know, we could and we did report whatever we wanted. We were only limited by our ethics and by by what we saw. I mean, uh, uh, it's few of the people, few of the citizens that we talked uh, to were criticizing Russia. They were criticizing Russian military. Majority of the Mariupol uh, citizens were bitterly angry at uh, at Ukrainian army. They were blaming. They were putting the entire blame for everything what happened to them to the Ukrainian army. But there was a, let's say, strong minority, something like I don't know, thirty percent of people, who were putting the blame on the Russians. Mm-hmm. And uh, we were each time we went to Mariupol back then, uh, when Mariupol was still under under some sort of fire, when there was when there was still some fighting going on, we were always escorted by uh, soldiers of the EPR, Donetsk People's mm-hmm. Republic. At no point. Those soldiers interrupted with uh, intervened in anything that we did as a journalist. They were only taking care of our security. You know, like don't go yeah. over there. There could be a sniper. Don't go over there. There could be mines or whatever. Yeah. They in, in, interfered in no way with our journalist business. Uh, so we had total liberty to talk uh, with whoever we wanted. And as I say, majority of the people was totally in shock, totally in shock. They, they were even telling that, you know, like when we would ask them, how do you feel? And they were like, I don't even know how to feel because we are in shock. And uh, around them, it was uh, it was like an apocalyptic uh, town. Everything literally looked like uh, you are in a nightmare. So... Yeah, I could understand all that. And I think I was, last time I was in Mariupol, it was in November. 
And even though the city is functioning once again, I mean, you can see ruins here and there, but mostly uh, streets are uh, clean, uh, public transportation is uh, functioning, uh, transportation is functioning, you know, cars are moving, uh, people are walking, uh, everything seems normal. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think that they're still in shock. Uh, the way they, uh, I don't know, look and talk, and I mean, we didn't have too much communication with them in November, we were only there for a day. But, uh, yeah, I think that they're still uh, processing what happened. I to guess circle, that, uh, to I... circle back, I just want to circle back to, because um, you said you said that, like, you know, you fell in love with the people of Donbass and, and, and the spirit there of the people. And that's one thing that, like, I can, I can uh, second, basically, and agree with 100%, is that, like, when I went there, I was struck by the courage and the willpower of the people to like uh, continue with their daily life as you say like the public transport is working the streets are clean uh, people are going to work in the morning taking the public transport and all the while there's like a war in some places two kilometers away and in other places you know 10 15 kilometers away so it's this like resolve and this iron will of the people that is uh, absolutely amazing if you ask me well, uh, when you say streets are clean, we have to uh, clarify what we mean by that. Uh, it's not uh, clean in a way some, some parts of Western cities are clean. It is 10 times cleaner or 100 times cleaner. Uh, it's unimaginable. I, I think that absolutely true. Yeah. I mean, yeah. If, if you were to bring an average. Uh, Londoner or a Parisian or Berliner or New Yorker uh, or Chicagoan or you know you name it uh, to bring if you were to bring them to Donetsk under shelling I think that would be the that would be the first thing they are totally blown away by mm -hmm. and, uh, how clean everything is uh, I mean, you can literally, when, when you're eating something and it's, you, you drop it accidentally on the, on the, on the street, you, you can literally pick it up from the street and continue eating. I mean, not that I did it at any, any, at any point, you know, but yeah, it's, it's literally, it's uh, for us who, live, who don't live in the Russian world, we actually don't know uh, what the word, we don't have the, the basic apprehension of the word, of the very term, clean. The way Russian, mm -hmm. uh, R Russian cities are by far the cleanest cities I've ever seen. I can agree. Yeah. Scandinavia, even so, so don't get me wrong. I, I've been around, and Russian mm -hmm. cities are by far the cleanest. I've never been to Belarus, and people tell me that uh, you don't know what clean. Is. Even Russians say keep saying that you don't know what clean is until you go to Belarus. So I don't know what's going on there, but uh, from what I've seen. Uh, and it's a uh, bigger, bigger, bigger part of Europe and the United States. Russian cities are amazing. Mm -hmm. And uh, that is true even for the uh, areas affected by war. So, I mean, of course, you asked me about uh, the mood in Lugansk and Donetsk. In Lugansk, uh, the right. city of Lugansk uh, had it somewhat easier. Good for them, of course. But there was no fighting uh, in the city this time around. I mean, in the last year, there, there really wasn't fighting there. City of Lugansk was uh, under fire, under under shelling, actually, only at the beginning of the war. And, and it was a very, that was a very dangerous time. Back then, I think Lugansk even had it worse than Donetsk. How many times have you actually been to the Donbass? I don't know. I mean... 15 like five six no, no 15 or like, 20 times something like, something like that 15 20 I, times I, I, and I, I really, i'm really not sure uh i mean in the last year i spent mm -hmm. uh, around five months in donbass mostly in donetsk yeah uh, in uh, I, i've been there uh, february and march may and june and part of uh, october and november the reason that I want uh, that I asked that is because I want to like segue or like introduce the idea that, of your documentary film. So when when in your like span of visiting the Donbass did you decide I need to make a film about this? Uh, 
Actually, and I'm gonna play, and I'm before you answer. Sorry, I'm gonna play some uh, some clips from your from your film in the background while we talk. So yeah, go ahead. So I can talk while you're playing the clip. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Uh, actually, uh, my editor back then, uh, when I was working for the Russian website, uh, she um, suggested that I should write a book uh, uh, about my experience in Donbass. She was like, uh, it's a fascinating thing. This is my editor, actually. This is Anya Filimonovna. She's... Um, and the movie is called uh, Brothers by Enemies, or in Serbian, Brothers by Bracha po neprijatelju. Brothers by Enemies, yeah. And uh, Anja Filimonova is my uh, was my editor back then, and uh, she suggested that I should write a book because it's like an interesting idea, uh, Donbas uh, in the eyes of a Serb. And uh, yeah, I first thought about book, but then I realized that the book is going to be read by only uh, limited number of people. That uh, with the with the movie with the documentary, I can possibly reach much more, much bigger audience, mm -hmm. and that's why I uh, I decided to make a movie instead. This was uh, Alexey Markov. Uh, sadly, he he he's not with us anymore. He died in a traffic accident uh, some two and a half years ago. He was the head of the Prizrak battalion in Lugansk. So uh, that's why I decided to make a movie. And uh, that is actually not the first movie I made, but it was the first movie I published uh, or as, as an author. And I'm, I don't know if, if I'm allowed to say that, but I'm terribly proud of that movie. Because you... Of course you should be, yeah. Any, any piece of work like that that brings the truth out and then uh, on top of that has a human factor to it, the, that's, a, that's a good story. You I be proud. hope that uh, it's, uh, I mean, that the the main purpose of, of that movie, the main point was to, yes, to bring the Donbass perspective to those who weren't, uh, who didn't encounter it so far. Because uh, sadly, uh, back then, I made that movie from 2017 to 2019, mm -hmm. early 2019. And... Uh, Back then, uh, even in Russia, Donbas perspective was somewhat lost. Because Russia back then did, didn't even know what to do with Donbas. I mean, that's one of the biggest lies of, of uh, this war and uh, anti-Russian propaganda is that uh, Russia is some evil empire that is uh, hell-bent on uh, expanding its territory over uh, at, the, at the expense of its neighbors. Which is ridiculous. Which not, considering actually, it's, it's, it's a lot. Considering you mentioned, considering you mentioned uh, anti-Russian propaganda, I have to, I have to, uh, I have to ask you, because um, you you mentioned you've been in this game or in this profession, let's say, for uh, for uh, over a quarter century almost, and uh, what is your take on the on the anti-Russian propaganda and the Russian propaganda? Like, how does how does that differ from one side to the other, or how does uh, how how do you see any parallels between the Russian or the anti-Russian propaganda and the anti-Yugoslav or anti-Serb propaganda in the 1990s? Because you said you started in '96, so I presume that you uh, did some journalistic work also during the '90s, during the breakup of Yugoslavia. How do you see the parallels of anti-Serb and anti-Russian? You know. There are parallels, of course. That's one of the reasons why I uh, titled the movie uh, Brothers by Enemies. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, the point is that uh, anti serb propaganda was and is vicious, mm -hmm. is uh, malign, is really, I mean, evil to the bone. Uh, but but this uh, anti-Russian propaganda in the last for the, in, in the last year is is really something else. I never expected to to see something like this, honestly. Even you mean like canceling Tchaikovsky and stuff like that? Uh, even though I lived through the nineties, not only that. I mean that is of course ridiculous. <laughs> no, it's it's not actually ridiculous. It it is it is purely evil. Oh, that's a good word too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but it's but 
you know, like, I guess the difference is that uh, we we Serbs sadly weren't uh, an adequate opponent. We were not a match for the West back then. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. They were stronger than us in every possible way, infinite number of times. They were stronger than us uh, economically, uh, militarily, uh, and diplomatically, and of course, propaganda-wise. Mm-hmm. So they they didn't bother too much. It's not, it's not that they didn't they weren't committed to 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 anti-Serb propaganda, but they knew that whatever they they are going to do, they will end up victorious in the end. So yeah. they didn't actually pay too much attention to what they've been doing. Mm-hmm. This time around, uh, Russia is, of course, uh, quite a match for them. Um, not in a media, not in an informational sense, not in a propaganda sense, but militarily, of course, economically, it's obvious now. Diplomatically, yeah, Russia is a match. Mm-hmm. Well, they have to be careful. They are paying much more attention to what they're doing. So, uh, anti serb propaganda was, as I said, vicious, but it was it was all consuming in a way that uh, whenever Serbs were brought up as a topic of discussion, mm-hmm. one was uh, almost obliged to say that uh, Serbs are genocidal maniacs who are committing horrible crimes against uh, their neighbors and whatever that 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 sounds that sounds exactly like how these days every time anybody mentions uh, you know the special military operation they have to yeah. say it was unprovoked putin's yeah. crazy unprovoked aggression yeah. you know <laughs> like that kind of discipline is something new there was no discipline like that in the 90s uh, uh, in terms of anti serb propaganda uh, you know, they they were they felt obliged to say that uh, Serbs are genocidal maniacs, but they didn't repeat the exact words and phrases. Mm-hmm. But this time around, you can clearly see that there is a di- discipline involved. Yeah, uh, and uh, re- they feel obliged to repeat exact phrases like. Uh, it's totally unprovoked for. You can see those in the articles. I mean, uh, career journalists are writing reports or articles about this war, and in the first paragraph or two, they are going to uh, write that uh, this war was totally unprovoked. I I can bet my life on on the fact that uh, if you were to go uh, in past times and check earlier articles and uh, reports from those same of those same journalists about other wars, previous wars, Mm -hmm. I guarantee that you wouldn't be able to find phrases like that. Yeah, of course. Not only that, not only that, but like, uh, especially subscribers of this channel, we've had other guests on and we've gone through the geopolitical and uh, all kinds of analyses of the situation before and after the start of the special military operation and how, you know, this is not unprovoked. This is something that has been uh, building up, been building up to since like the fall of the Berlin Wall, basically. And uh, and uh, like, uh, OK, uh, yes, yeah, some things were going on uh, ever since the fall of the Berlin Wall. But uh, this cycle of violence started uh, in late 2013. People mm-hmm. just need to know that people just need. Yeah, yeah. And people can check everything I'm about to say in late in late 2013, America and the West organized a coup in uh, Ukraine. There is no other word for that, especially because of uh, what America itself was accusing Russia of only two years later, when Donald Trump won elections in 2016. uh, Many in America, uh, journalists, analysts, uh, even uh, Secret Service and whatnot, were accusing Russia of kidnapping their democracy. 
Yeah, yeah. Of uh, 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 influencing the elections. Yeah, 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 yeah. It was. Uh... By, by, uh, and and what was the method of Russia Russia's influence? Uh, they were writing mean tweets and mean posts on Facebook, right? Yeah. That's it. And th- and that is and that is why I consider this a comedy show because yeah. like the, par- the the timeline that we're living in the only way I can deal with it is to understand it through gallows humor Paris, because Paris. like there's a lot. Sure. Just please compare that to what was going on in late 2013 in Ukraine. There yeah. were there were violent protests each day on the streets of Kiev. I'm not talking about demands of the protests. I'm talking about whether they were right or wrong to protest. Yeah. I'm just saying the fact that there were violent protests in the streets of Kiev. And America was demanding from the Ukrainian government at the time to withdraw police forces from the street. Demanding. Now, is that influence or not? Is it uh, more uh, influential than posts on Facebook and tweets on Twitter? See, see you, you're, you must be new to Newspeak and George Orwell's terminology. That is democracy and freedom. Now, that is democracy and freedom. <laughs> that is 2020. That's something everybody knew at the time. Move a month forward. Or ex mm. months forward, late fe- uh, late sorry, late January, 2014. Yeah, uh, there is a leaked uh, conversation between Victoria Nuland, who was then just as she is now under Secretary uh, of State for uh, Eurasia business, I think, and uh, she was talking to American ambassador in Kiev, Jeffrey Payet. She is literally dictating to him. Uh, who's going to be in the next Ukrainian government and who is never to be allowed to be part of the next Ukrainian government. And all of the people that she names got into the positions that she named, basically. So yeah. she was either very lucky or uh, actually everything was her design. <laughs> you, you're right. She was lucky. That's what so, it was. So, I mean, just compare that to mean tweets and mean posts <laughs> about Hillary Clinton. Mean tweets, man. You can't tweet mean ben things. Kiev. Negotiations between Ukrainian opposition and Viktor Yanukovych. Mm-hmm. Negotiations were meditated by, guess who? Radoslav Sikorsky. Mediated. Mediated, Mediated, not meditated. Mediated, yeah. Sorry. By, guess who? Radoslav Sikorsky. At the time. Who's that? He was the foreign minister of Poland. Okay. He's the guy who. Uh, last year, when the Nord Stream exploded, when the Nord Stream pul- pipelines pipelines exploded, because of course pipelines. He's the guy with the tweet. <laughs> pipelines have a, a, a nasty habit of exploding on their own, because yeah. there is no way that anybody uh, uh, blow blew up those pipelines. No, no, they exploded on their own. But Radoslav Sikorsky didn't know that that they exploded on their own. So his first reaction on Twitter was thank you america yeah yeah i remember that i remember that that, that was, was hilarious that's the guy who was the mediator of the negotiations <laughs> independent independent impartial mediator yeah. now <laughs> but not only that we know now that he's really not impartial we knew mm-hmm. back then because he was recorded i mean i, I guess that he was still uh, unfamiliar with the new reality that everybody has a cell phone now. So after uh, when they were, they needed, the West needed some sort of agreement between the two sides, between the president and the opposition, in order to break that agreement, in order for the president to put the guard down, and uh, then agreement can be broken. But first they needed to uh, to make an agreement, to to. to to, uh, they needed both sides to accept something, mutual agreement. In order to do that, they made an agreement that's uh, a little more favorable, fair, favorable to the president, a little more favorable than, than the opposition were uh, willing to accept. So the opposition leaders 
were like, no, no, no way. We're not gonna, we're not, we're not gonna sign this. And then an adult of Sikorsky turned toward them and said, if you don't do this, you will lose your heads. Your heads are in line, are online. That's what he said. Find it. I mean, I, I, I'm paraphrasing. I'm not actually yeah, yeah, yeah. calling the exact word. Words. So that, compare that to mean tweets and mean, mean Facebook posts about Hillary Clinton. So by what can I say? By in, in West, 99? By, in, West, if, by the West standards, what mm -hmm. happened if the uh, American elections in 2016 were irregular or influenced by a foreign power or whatnot, then what happened in Ukraine in late 2013 and early 2014 is not only a coup, but possibly the, the democratic process, but possibly the most obvious coup ever. Mm -hmm. So, what immediately followed the coup was okay. There were a couple of developments that uh, that went pretty much bloodless. I'm talking about uh, independence of Crimea and uh, then rejoining of Crimea and Russia which the West calls annexation of Crimea, even though it really isn't annexation of Crimea. They keep forgetting that Crimea had an autonomy inside Ukraine. Crimea reacted to the coup in a way that, no, we're not going to accept the new government because it's illegal, it's illegitimate, it's criminal, it's fascist. So no. we're going to stage, a re we're going to organize a referendum about our independence. The referendum was organized, people voted for independence, by that time, the constitution of Ukraine was already in 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 in, in how do you say in rubbles in in in, in, the, in, in rubble in rubble yeah rubble, yeah uh, was already disintegrated ruined yeah the, by the by the new Kiev regime, so Crimea didn't have a single reason to uh, respect the constitution anymore, but they actually did they they did follow the letter of the law. And uh, they organized a referendum, and the referendum showed that uh, Crimean people actually want nothing to do with Kiev anymore. So they mm -hmm. independence, and then Russia voted about uh, re accepting uh, Crimea uh, into the Russian Federation, and that's it. There is no annexation. Now, then, military appeared, but on the invitation from the Kiev, uh, Crimea government, and everything went bloodlessly, luckily. But people in Odessa weren't so lucky. On May 2nd, 2014, there was a huge pro-Russian rally in Odessa. People who were on the streets declaring support for Russia or against the new Kiev government were then attacked with assistance of the police, which by that point were or was already by under control, the full control of the Kiev regime. So those uh, pro-Russian activists were attacked. Uh, some of them escaped to the. Um, it's not city hall actually. It's it's um, uh, syndicate building, building of the syndicates in in, in Odessa, and then they were locked and burned alive. Uh, and the police at, watched. At least 50 people, by some some accounts, 100 people were burned mm -hmm. alive that day. Yeah. Up to that point, maybe there was possibly some way out of that mess. That the rapprochement, would, yeah. That would, uh, that would be non-violent. But after that, no. Because Russia, of course, will never allow for their fellow Russians to be burned alive with impunity. Of course mm. not. No yeah. country would ever willingly allow that. And of all, especially superpower. I mean, we Serbs, sadly, because we are, Serbia is now weak or whatever, we cannot 
react like that, even though crimes against Serbs are happening in neighboring countries almost daily. But Russia is not Serbia. Russia is a superpower. Yeah. After that happened, Russia was Russia had no other choice but to look at the Kiev regime as a hostile regime. And he had no other way than to seek justice for the people that were burned alive. The way Russia was seeking justice was to help Donbass. Yeah. Because Donbass reacted to what happened in Odessa by organizing a referendum of referendums of their own. And that's but, the one that you were invited to, no, correct? No, 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 no. I was invited to local elections two years ago. Oh, okay. Okay. This was happening in 2014. So they actually uh, followed the Crimea example. They were like, okay, if Crimea joined Russia so fast, we want to do the same. Now, for one reason or another, Russia didn't react the same way as they reacted in, in, in the case of Crimea. So you had a, a, a strange situation. Donetsk and Lugansk declared independence, and Russia was helping them, but only humanitarily, not militarily. They were helping economically, but not militarily. And Russia even didn't recognize those two republics. So the, the, Russia couldn't allow itself to leave them behind. But on the other hand, Russia didn't want to recognize their independence because Russia was afraid how will that be looked at in the international community. So we had a strange situation. But just to repeat once more, uh, it was never it was never to be a forward straightforward uh, line to the war. But the moment those people were burned in Odessa, the war was inevitable. It mm -hmm. could happen earlier or later. It could be more or less messy. It could be more or less bloody. But mm -hmm. war was inevitable because. Uh, <laughs> It changed the paradigm totally. Sure. It changed the psyche, sure. both of the people sure. and the politicians. It wasn't uh, about ideology anymore. It was about people's lives. Yeah. Uh, so when Donetsk and Lugansk declared independence, uh, Ukraine uh, let all their frustration on Donbas because they mm -hmm. couldn't do anything against Crimea. Crimea was pretty much protected by Russian uh, forces uh, the moment he declared independence. But Donbass was actually not protected. And they sent the army to Donetsk and Lugansk. Donetsk city and Lugansk city were bombed. Downtown yep. of Donetsk and downtown of Lugansk was bombed. People were murdered on the streets of Lugansk and Donetsk. Just because they happen to be there. Yep. Now, is that unprovoked? Now, th does that mean um, when they say unprovoked? <laughs> um, I see you're getting the gist of this channel. This is my, my, my channel here is the best... Or sorry, it is the worst comedy channel on YouTube. That is my new that is my new slogan, um, because the, the 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 narratives that the West is putting are so 180 degrees opposite, or as uh, Baerbock says, 360 degrees opposite. Um, <laughs> that, that that all you can do is laugh at them. They're like if you if you have even two minutes to look into the details of anything they say, you find out that it's ex exactly the opposite of what they're saying. Just think about this. Azov Battalion was uh, fighting out of Mariupol. Mm -hmm. They were fighting out of Mariupol for years. Then, when the special military, military operation began in late February last year, uh, they were confronted suddenly with much stronger force than they were used to. So more serious, yeah. 
So they were retreating day by day, mm -hmm. week by week. Eventually, they were, they found themselves totally uh, in only one part of Mariupol. And still, there were reports that Azov Battalion is bravely fighting Russians. Yeah. They were painted as a heroes to the West, to Ukrainian public and the Western public. Mm -hmm. And then when they finally surrendered, I'll repeat, surrendered. Yeah. They were evacuated. <laughs> or Western media said that they were evacuated. Evacuated straight to Russian uh, holding cells. <laughs> if it weren't about people's lives, if it wasn't about the war, mm -hmm. that kind of reporting would deserve any ridicule ever. Yeah. But sadly, it's about lives and it's about war. Mm -hmm. So it's some, propaganda. It's nothing less I than think, propaganda. Uh, but listen, there is propaganda and there is propaganda. <laughs> you know, when people are saying Russian propaganda, uh, yeah, they do have propaganda because any country involved in any conflict will always have propaganda. It doesn't even have to be a conflict. It can be like local self, no, like whatever no, you're no, doing, whatever image you're presenting is propaganda. Of course, no, of course, but... It is only logical that the country involved in a conflict, in a military conflict, mm -hmm. will have propaganda. Yeah. So the fact that Russia has propaganda is really nothing extraordinary, nothing new. Mm -hmm. But Russian propaganda is, it's, it may be ineffective, it may be slow, it may be primitive, but it's le at least it is not absurdly, ridiculously stupid. Yeah. As evacuation of Azov or the ghost of Kiev. Since you bring propaganda up, or, or go on, go on. Probably the most uh, dangerous piece of propaganda. Mm -hmm. uh, one day, the West and Ukraine were like uh, those bad Russians took control or took control of the Zaporozhye nuclear power plant, and the very next day they were like, "Oh, Russians are bombing." The themselves uh, nuclear power plant <laughs> really the same plant that they can to control of yesterday so now now they're bombing it they're crazy russians they bomb themselves for fun bomb man themselves. you don't yeah. understand <laughs> that is uh how insane or just remember the the uh two missiles that fell in poland it was in mm -hmm. December. Mm -hmm. If it wasn't for that farmer, saved us from World War Three, basically. If it, if that farmer didn't video it, it would have been World I'm not War Three. Sure that Ukraine is admitting even now that those were their missiles. I, it doesn't matter. It, it really doesn't it, matter it, anymore. Still claiming it's it's uh, Russian missiles. So Since, that's the level of not not uh, 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 this is a level of absurd uh, danger that we're facing mm -hmm. because of that propaganda. It's like uh, I, what Hannah Arendt said: the banality of evil. I just wanna, I just wanna draw a parallel to propaganda now and propaganda back uh, in the '90s. Um, in the '90s, when '99, uh, uh, when uh, Yugoslavia then started being bombed um, by NATO, uh, the one of the first things that they hit within the first week was the TV station, and that was their way to turn off. Uh, that was their way to turn off Serbian propaganda. But uh, nowadays they have to turn off RT itself. Uh, how, do you, how do you see the parallels between, uh, you know, the propaganda war in the 90s and... Uh, I, I just, sorry, but I have to correct you. Uh, no, uh, TV station was not among the first uh, sites that was bombed, that were bombed. But it was bombed, nevertheless. Uh, and... Uh, it is. Uh, I mean, it might. It might have been a TV tower then. It might have been uh, the TV tower that was oh, bombed TV tower during the was, first days. Yeah, TV yeah. tower was. Uh, uh, listen, uh, TV uh, bombing a TV station is. Uh, I, I guess it's as obvious a war crime as there is. I mean, as possible. How can you make a war crime more obvious? Either it's command and control infrastructure. I remember, I remember Jamie Shea saying it. You can. It's command and control. What's going on in a TV station the entire day? 
you can clearly see at any given moment, you can see that it's a civilian infrastructure, not a military one. Mm -hmm. And they still bombed it. And nobody ever answered for that crime. They killed 16 people. Yeah, I know I know the daughter of one of those people. They killed 16 people. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's, uh, that's, that's how uh, criminally insane they were even back then. And nobody, else. I mean, they bombed Chinese embassy. When they were yeah. in Belgrade in 99, they bombed the Serbian TV station and they bombed Chinese embassy. And nobody I have ever video. answered for any of those crimes. They were bombing uh, uh, trains, civilian trains. They were bombing refugee, refugee columns. Mm -hmm. Nobody ever answered for that. They were bombing markets, public markets. They were bombing houses, residential areas. And nobody ever answered for that. Yeah. Nobody ever. But the biggest crime about bombing of Serbia is this. They keep repeating that NATO had to intervene in order to protect Albanians because we Serbs were committing a genocide against Albanians. Mm. That's what? 24 years later, today, there is not a single piece of evidence that any crime, let alone genocide, against the Albanians was going on in Kosovo prior to the bombing. Not even the Hague Tribunal was able yeah. to produce anything even remotely, that even remotely resembles an evidence of that. So, this is a pure fact. Once again, everybody can check this. Uh, 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 in all of those uh, cases against Serb military and civilian leaders in the Hague, not a single case of those contains any reference to anything that predates the NATO bombing. Mm -hmm. uh, Milosevic trial, Ojdanic trial, uh, Lukic trial, you name it. No event prior to March 24th, 1999 is even mentioned in any of those charges. Not even the Hague Tribunal was able to find any evidence that Serbia was doing anything wrong before the NATO bombing. So there really was no justification whatsoever. That was the very definition of the unprovoked aggression. Yeah. The very definition. Of course, they're not admitting it. Yeah, yeah. Um... You, when you were in Donbass, uh, one of your reports, uh, let's say relatively recently, uh, was from the bio labs. Yeah. Um, how do you do? You, do you see it? Like, okay, we've made a lot of parallels tonight with the uh, with the different uh, with the different aspects of the NATO slash evil coming from the West uh, against uh, Serbia and now against uh, Russia through the people of Donbass. So do you see any uh, similarities between the biolabs and the yellow house and the organ harvesting and stuff like that? Because we all know that it's also happening now in Ukraine. Hmm. Uh, actually, biolabs is not really the same thing, same case as... Uh, as uh organ harvesting or organ trafficking. Mm -hmm. mm, I've heard rumors, but I didn't uh, investigate uh, investigate that uh, that uh, report, that um, there is organ trafficking in Donbass too. In but there's, a, there, there's basically a very dark force, is what I'm saying. There's a dark uh, spirit behind yeah, this entity that really is attacking. The same. I mean, uh, organ trafficking in Kosovo was uh, committed by uh, Albanian terrorist thugs. They are thugs. I mean, uh, Hashim Tachi is a gangster or a terrorist. He's mm. not some uh, Moriarty. He's not the, the genius of evil. No, he's just a tag. Ramos Haradina is a tag and a gangster and a terrorist. That's it. Uh, so, uh, the, what's going on in Ukraine about biolabs is another level. That is something uh, um, organized uh, by the United States of America. As Victoria Nuland practically admitted it when she was testifying in, testifying in front of the Congress, I believe, or Senate, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. months ago, 
when she was questioned by Marco Rubio. I mean, even that conversation speaks about <laughs> the level of their incompetence. Marco Rubio was asking her, uh, he was serving her uh, softballs, you know, he, he was serving yeah. easy questions, at least he thought those were easy mm-hmm. questions, but uh, along the way, he managed to confuse her, and she started giving answers that she wasn't supposed to. So she actually confirmed that, yes, America, along with Ukraine, was uh, running secret bio labs along the border with Russia and with Donbass. So when I was in the area uh, in November, I asked uh, Lugansk authorities, can I visit some of those sites? And they actually allowed me to visit uh, uh, near Rubezhne, uh, one such lab. And uh, I'm really not an expert uh, in the medicine or especially laboratories, lab work, but uh, what I saw there really raises suspicions. You know, it's really disturbing. If even half of the things that uh, Russians claim are true, Mm -hmm. yes, just like you said, there is a very dark force behind Ukraine, current Ukrainian regime. Very mm-hmm. dark force. I mean, uh, uh, giving uh, people I mean, people who volunteer to be to 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 test new medicine. You have that in every in every country everywhere, you know. But uh, uh, it's a, it's um, required by law that you tell them that, that first every medicine has to be tested on uh, animals. Yeah. They didn't do that with uh, these. And yeah. they hid it from uh, from the people who were... The patients, yeah. Yeah, from the patients, from the volunteers. That's wrong. They were blackmailing uh, uh, pensioners, you know, uh, mm-hmm. retired folks. They were blackmailing them. If you want to uh, pick up your pension, go go there near the front line they were actually organizing buses for for pensioners to drive them 200 or 300 kilometers you know in order to pick up the pension and yeah they would give them pension but along with the pension they would give them a pill or a vaccine yeah now if this true and so far i have no reason to doubt uh, I mean, the, the Russian people did, Lugansk people did provide me with, with a bunch of evidence, which of course mm-hmm. somebody has to check and verify. I cannot because I, I can't uh, ever go. Understand, yeah, the medical stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Because I, I, can, I can't ever go to, to territory controlled by the Ukrainians because I'm on Mirotvorets for, for years. Uh-huh. And they would arrest me and possibly even kill me. So, uh, yeah, I can't uh, investigate that, but somebody can and somebody should. Mm -hmm. Will it be done? God knows. I mean, I can guess that uh, it will be investigated uh, as much as uh, the bombing of Serbian TV station was investigated and uh, the bombing of Chinese embassy in Belgrade was investigated. Not at all, sadly. I'm sure the Chinese investigated the bombing of the Chinese embassy. I'm I'm sure the Chinese uh, know a lot. I hope. You know what I mean? I... And I'm sure the Russians also know a lot that they're not disclosing yet. Um, it's been almost an hour here. Uh, I'm sure that our viewers are very thankful for your visit. I don't like to take it over an hour because then uh, people don't have time usually to watch it. We can come back and record another one immediately. But uh, to sign off, I just want to say that uh, Miodrag is going back to the Donbass. Miodrag, tell people where they can uh, follow you. Uh, the YouTube cha- YouTube channel I'm uh, reporting for uh, is Helmcast. H-E-L-M-C-A-S-T. And uh, or they can also find me on Telegram. Uh, it's uh, Zarkovich, but uh, 
all the letters are Cyrillic except for the first letter, which is. Uh, we'll share it. We'll share it in yeah. the description here sometime. And uh, that, uh, also, channel, you're on Twitter, aren't you? The Telegram channel is, uh, let's say, it's still developing, uh, uh, but it will be fully functioning uh, by the point by by the time when I'm in uh, Donbas, which will be, mm -hmm. let's say, less than ten days. So right now there are some reports there, some uh, uh, videos are posted, but uh, the main uh, activity will become will begin uh, the moment when I'm in Donbas. Yeah, yeah, excellent, perfect. Thank you so much for joining us. It's been uh, really swell. Thanks. Uh, and now, and now a little bit in Serbian. Because like uh, this is this is like a really difficult situation to get two Serbs to talk English for everybody. So like, uh, hvala vam svima koji ste na srpsko pratili o, ovo i hvala tebi što si imao strpljenja da ono, kako da kažem, forsiraš engleski sa... sa, e, ne, sa... Atno, koliko mi je teško, ja mislim da nikad teže nisam pričao engleski nego sada. Da li zašto znam da si Srbin, ono pa... Ne znam, čuo si mi verovatno da, da bolje pričam engleski, ono kad, sam, kad smo bili u Donbasu sa, sa Rasalom, kad pričam recimo ili sa Johnnyem, pričam da. engleski nego sada, sad sam se baš nešto zapetilo, malo, 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 my glasses my glasses scare people and uh, and yeah, yeah that's why that's that's why your english has been uh, not not up to par anyway everybody thank you for uh, sticking along don't forget to like share and subscribe check out the patreon if you're interested and uh, i'm gonna take it out with some music Miodrag. thanks a lot Dwight. uh where's the music what happened to the music i can sing if you want no no don't sing that's gonna ruin the entire episode but if if huh? mm. oh there it is okay music no yes there we go goodbye everybody